I just want to share what my intentions are in, in, this, in this time that we have together. I want to share a little bit about my story, and then I, wanna, I have a burden to help uh, pastors that have to deal with prophetic people. <laughs> you love me already, don't you? You love me, you love me. Um, and please don't be offended. It, it's totally on purpose. But um, prophetic people can be strange. And yet, we pastors need you. And, and so hopefully I'm going to lend some language as to, to what's healthy, what is, what's biblical, what really, really isn't biblical. What do you do when somebody shows up at your church and, and says, um, you know, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophetess, I'm, I'm prophetic, I'm a, we don't know how long we're going to be here, but as long as we are, we want to bless the church. What does a pastor do with stuff like that? And because it happens, doesn't it? Okay. And, and so I are one, and hopefully I'll be able to help a, a little bit. Um, so let me first kind of explain how I, how I came into this, because I wasn't, I wasn't raised in the church. I was raised Polish Catholic on the west side of Grand Rapids, and uh, on, my, on my west side peeps, yeah, kibasa and sauerkraut and all that's good and holy in life. So I... Uh, I, the first church service outside of the Catholic church I ever went to, I was up till five in the morning snorting coke with my buddy who um, ye, a few years after I got saved went on to rob nine banks in the Grand Rapids area. He was called the Lucky Noontime Bandit. Go ahead, look him up, my buddy. And uh, um, <laughs> tremendous influence in my life. And uh, so... I, I, I get saved out of the Catholic Church, boom, into an assembly of God Church Large, AFG Church in Grand Rapids. And um, growing up in the AFG, you know, we'd see the gifts of the Holy Spirit and stuff like that, but did not see a lot of prophetic ministry. And I'll never forget the first time I was exposed to, to any prophetic ministry at all. Um, it was a, a, a minister named Dick Mills. How many of you have ever heard of Dick Mills before? Um, just a, I, I, I just thought, who is this guy, you know, that's calling people out in the congregation? And how does he know this stuff about them? How does he know what they do for a living? How does they? I was fascinated by it. And here I am. I'm sitting in the front row of a choir loft, um, same choir loft that I met my wife in. And... Uh, um, I'm sitting in the front row of the choir loft, and Dick Mills gets done calling people out of the congregation, and he sits down, and he starts writing on a piece of paper, and he turns back to the choir, and he, and he gives it to the guy next to me, and the guy goes for me, and he goes, no, 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 the one next to you. And he gave it to me, and it was the first prophetic word that I had ever received. I clung to those verses that he gave me, still are critical in my life today, but you know, that was kind of like my, my introduction to prophetic ministry. And then I, I became a youth pastor in Grand Haven for three years. And out of all of the churches that I could be in, in our network of churches at the time, the church that I was on staff at was a church that was very given to the prophetic. And our network at the time wasn't, yet my pastor was. And so it offered me an opportunity to grow and to flourish. And he had great grace for me. And, uh, and I, I get it um, as, a, as a senior leader. If you're, how many senior pastors do I have? How many lead pastors do I have in this room? All right, all right, all right, all right. My pastor would say, John, when you would say that God was showing you something, I would cringe. And, uh, and I'm, sure that, I'm sure that some of you lead pastors right now, oh, I know the cringe. The cringe is real. The struggle is real. And, uh, and so I, I totally, totally get it. And my heart goes out to you, but if we ever needed strong, healthy, prophetic ministry, it's now. And depending on what kind of school you came out of um, prophetically, um, you might just see things differently. I, I, I was kind of raised in a, in a prophetic environment in, in Grand Haven where, you know, presbyteries were, you know, get in the chair and about 10, 20 sweaty hands are on you. And, you know, if you got anything, just give it. And, and you know, we just kind of... We let it fly. And by the way, Pastor Les Beecham, 
um, from Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, is teaching on presbytery. If you want more language on what that is, please get his notes. He's an amazing, amazing Bible teacher. And so right now, simultaneously, he's teaching on prophetic presbytery and what it is and what it's all about. Pastor Lee uh, calls me and um, he, uh, he said, um, you just need to get down to the church um, Saturday night. And, uh, and I said, what? He goes, we're having, we're having presbytery. And I go, what do you mean you're, you're, you're having it? I go, presbytery is like a spontaneous thing. You get in the chair. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you've never seen this before. He goes, I want you to come. I go, man, I don't, John, just shut up and get here Saturday night. <laughs> and I said, all right, all right, all right, all right. And he goes, sit in the front row. And that was the first time in my life I ever saw healthy, practical, prophetic ministry under Pastor Tom Lane um, from Gateway Church and the team that he came with. His son was with him. Um, Pastor Marcus uh, was also with him that time. And I sat there kind of, could this be real? Could I, you know, is this the unicorn, you know, that, you know, none of us have ever really, really seen? Could there really be healthy prophetic ministry like this? I am so doggone grateful today to be standing in front of you and the healthy prophetic ministry that the Radiant Network provides. I'm so grateful for the influences of pastors Tom Lane, Wayne Drain, Lauren Covarubias, um, Jimmy Evans, the tremendous influence that these men of God have been on Pastor Lee, and it's because of Pastor Lee that I'm here and able to share these things with you. So, so that being said, I know that... Um, that Prophetically, things can be kind of odd at times. And, and, and I get it. All I knew when we started our church 25 years ago, we're celebrating 25 years uh, this year. Um, all I knew, thanks. 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 The secret to success, I've got it for you. You want to write this down? Don't quit. There you go. If that, if, if it was worth the price of admission just for that. So, um, but back in the day, I... Uh, there was no real template. I knew that I was prophetic, and that's about it. And so we would do, you know, like prayer lines at, at the end of services. I, I found myself praying over the same people all the time. And I, 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 I got kind of frustrated. I got kind of discouraged. I, I felt like I was a, like a ride at Cedar Point that was just being taken over and over and over again. You know, I even had this, this person that would come up to me, Pastor John, you got a word for me? And I'd grab my Bible. I got a Bible full of them. Um, you know, pick it up. And they were just, I felt like they were just kind of pulling on my gift, the same people all the time. And so I really discouraged. I kind of tabled my gift. I just kind of focused on the, on the growth of the church. And, uh, and then I thought, no, I need to embrace who I am. And so I, I approached Lance Wall now one time and I said, do you know any prophetic ministry that I could bring to our church? And he goes, yeah, I do. So I bring these this couple to my church, and, and she's prophetically dancing, and then I got people that are pulling out flags and banners, and, and, uh, and I, I just thought, I would, I'm prophetic, but would I go to this church? Um, I'm the pastor. Would I go to this church? And until Pastor Lee, you know, presented healthy prophetic ministry, I didn't even, I'd never seen anything like, this is normal. They're not even touching them. They're not even, this is, this is crazy. And so, I want to I wanna help um, because at our church, we've got a lot of, of prophetically gifted people, but if you don't offer an opportunity for them to grow, then they're going to grow on their own, and that might not be pretty, and, and, and then you're going to have to try to steer them, and so I want to offer, I wanna offer some, some context for um, biblical, healthy, prophetic ministry, and we're going to look at maybe some Old Testament verses that you haven't seen before, um, and uh, and so you know. Hopefully, I help, and then I'll try to open it up for for questions at the end. But as I'm as I'm looking at the Old Testament, and you're going to be shocked at how they tie together concerning the prophetic, concerning prophecy and prophets. Um, it was very much community based, very community based. I. I, I struggle with the, the prophetic people that see themselves as these lone guns that roam from church to church, you know, on a, you know, you know, 
They, and they, they're just they're ripping off these prophetic words without any accountability, with seemingly no desire for community. I, I, I struggle with that. I don't see a biblical pattern for that. I, I, I just don't. And I don't know how good I'm going to do it sticking to my notes. But um, so um, let's just, you know, for, for some language and for some context, let's just settle something first and foremost. No one has the gift of prophecy. It's not yours. It's the Holy Spirit's. And so when someone says they have the gift of prophecy, you're trying to lay ownership to something that isn't even yours. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not yours. It's not resident or dormant in anyone. Um, you are used in the gift of prophecy. You're used in it. And it's at the Holy Spirit's discretion, you know, not yours. And so if he's using you in that, then, man, keep a tender heart. Keep a submissive heart. Um, but it, you, you, you don't own it. It's not in you. It flows through you as the Holy Spirit wills for the profit of all. And so I want to show you um, some verses maybe you've never noticed before. Go to, you're going to find it odd talking about the prophetic. Go to the book of Ezra. So before you get to Psalms, Job, go to the book of Ezra, chapter 5. Lord, help me get this all out so that when I leave, I feel like I got it all out. Look at Ezra 5, 2, and I'm going to tie this into the New Testament, and I'm going to show you how it's very, very consistent, um, even though we're talking like two different, really, you know, graces, Old Testament, New Testament. As you all know, the Holy Spirit wasn't even given in the Old Testament, but there were prophets in the Old Testament, it says in Ezra chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josedek, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Go to chapter 6 and look at verse 14. It says, and the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by the decree of God, the God of Israel, the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. Notice how the prophetic ministry, how prophets were supporting. Notice how they helped build. That's very, very key language when it comes to, to prophetic ministry. We know from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, that prophecy speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. Well, what's edification? What, what does it mean to edify? It means to build. It means to build up. That's why when someone speaks in a tongue, they edify themselves. They build themselves up. When someone prophesies, they edify the whole church. And 1 Corinthians 14 is an amazing chapter because you are going to find over and over and over again how the gift of prophecy builds and I love, let me just give you verse 32 in the New Living, probably words it better than any. And this is kind of my standard verse that I use for, for prophetic people that act um, like when the, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they, they just can't control themselves. This is how I am when the Holy Spirit comes on me. And I just want to offer a scripture, scripture being our guide, right? 1 Corinthians 14, 32 in the New Living says, Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirits, and they can take turns. <laughs> I'm sorry, that might not work with how you feel things should go down. But I'm sorry I'm not sorry, because you're, you, you, you might be freaking out your spiritual leadership. And, and they, and they want to use you, and they see that the gift on you is genuine. But what I had a... I had a person come to me one time in a service, and Pastor John, I believe I've got a word. And, I, and we have kind of a check and balance at our church because um, we just want to make sure that what goes forth is healthy and encouraging. And, and I said, well, what's your, what's your word? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to get up there, and I'm going to start worshiping in, in front of the congregation, and then the word's going to come. I said, well, why don't you go back to your seat and worship, and when the word comes, come back to me. Because what you're doing in front of everybody doesn't make sense doesn't make sense. So let me, let me suggest something. I remember Mike Bickle saying years ago, and I thought it was so good. He said, there are 
things that I do when I'm all alone with the Lord that feel right to me in the Holy Spirit, I don't know if there's a, a whole lot of biblical context for it, but I would never take it out in public. He says there are things that I allow to take place in the congregation that I wouldn't necessarily bring on the platform. I think there are respected areas where things might be able to fly and, 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 and things might be, be given a little bit more room, but I think sometimes we could be trying to drag our, our bedroom out into the public, and I think there are certain levels of intimacy that everybody doesn't need to see. I don't know about you, but I love my wife, but on Sunday morning in front of the congregation, I'm not making out with her in the front row. Um, so I, 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 the, the Bible says he's brought me into the king's chamber. It doesn't say that the king cham king's chamber was brought out into the public in the Song of Solomon. And so um, I think there is maybe the way that we, we experience God. I think that, that could be different from the way that we hear from God, and it could be different from the way that we're used by God. And so how you experience God, man, you could be, you might be bawling, you might be shaking, you might be in a crumpled mass in the front of the church. Praise God for the work that he's doing for you in that moment. Um, praise God for the way that, that he speaks to you and, and how you hear him. But when it comes to giving a message from God, the Holy Spirit's weird, not weird, and so we shouldn't be weird. And so I don't know if it benefits any, anyone for you to be praying loudly in your prayer language before you come and give somebody a message or for you to be shaking or for you to be bawling like you're out of control. For, it is about them. You're coming to them with something the Holy Spirit's given them, and you want to see that you deliver that. You're a messenger. You're a messenger. And so in our, in our church, I've, I've had to tell people, do you, do you have to do that? Can you can maybe ratchet it down a little bit so that the message is given opportunity? Because I guarantee you they're not going to hear a word you say, and they're just going to remember how frightening you were to them and how intimidating um, you were to them. So it's one thing to be touched by God in a significant way. It's quite another to deliver a message given by God. And ask yourself, ask yourself, what's more important, you or the message that the Holy Spirit's given you? What's more important? I need to know that the people are going to get that. I mean, I, 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 I want to know that they're not going to remember me. They're going to remember what God spoke to them. And I think sometimes we, we want so badly to, to, be, to be, you know, you know recognized and, you know, and, and was that good for you, man? Just, just give them what God gave you and try to get out of the way as soon as possible so that they can be thinking about what the, what the Lord has done. Um, when we have uh, prophetic presbyteries in our church, I'll tell folks, hey, you know, don't pray for everybody because there are a lot of people that want to be ministered to. Man, just give them the word. Give them word. Now, if it's kind of serious and can I pray for you, ask permission. Can I pray for you? Um, but I, it's very, very important that if you're going to be used and prophecy that you that you handle that message as it came from God and you treat it that way and you give it to people that need to hear that message you have no idea what they're going through you might not even have a clue as to what they're going through but it's so important that you get to get that to them and deliver the goods to them I'll also say this not everybody who prophesies is a prophet and honest it, it doesn't matter what they think or say if, if that was the case, then everybody who evangelizes is an evangelist. Then, then everybody who's pastoral is a pastor. Everyone who teaches is, teaches is a teacher. Ephesians 4 says that he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers. And, and they're likened to the, to the fingers on a hand. The prophet's the finger pointer, and he points things out, and he speaks for the heart of God, the evangelist is a middle finger. He sticks out from among the rest. The pastor's a ring finger. He's married to the church. The teacher's the pinky. He brings balance. And the apostle's the thumb because he touches all of them. Pastor Lee is an apostle, and he touches all of them. He touches all of them. But it says he gave some. He gave some. So the prophet is an office given. Prophecy is a gift given. And, and we don't own them. I am occupying an office for a time and for a season, and it's not mine. And I need to treat it as Jesus gave it. He gave some. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. The Bible says, but if all prophesy in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. So once we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and if you have not been 
baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor John, didn't I get the Holy Spirit when I got saved? Well, sure you did. Absolutely. But it's like a drink compared to immersion where you're, you're going swimming. Um, and so if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, please hang around afterwards. I would love to pray for you um, and see that you baptize in the Holy Spirit. But once you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, then the gifts of the Holy Spirit can now begin or they can be given opportunity to operate and to function in your life. So Matthew 3.11 says, uh, John the Baptist said, I've, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer and the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so um, Acts 19, 1 through, through 6. Um, well, let, let's, I'll go there. I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Acts 19. I thought this was so good. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country, came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Disciples. So these are people that have invited Jesus into their heart. These are disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? How unusual. How unusual that he would ask that. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, in the what then were you baptized? And they said, in the John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Three different events here. We're talking salvation. We're talking water baptism. We're talking spirit baptism. They've been likened unto the exodus. Um, the exodus leaving, leaving bondage in one kingdom for another, the promised land, you know, salvation. Uh, spirit baptism, walking through the parted sea. And, um, or water baptism, walking through the parted sea. Spirit baptism, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So those three have been likened into the Old Testament as uh, to the exodus. So um, I, I, I think three things are maybe foundation stones for stepping out in prophecy. I call, I'll call them the ABCs. I would say the ability to focus on another. So what we'll often do at our church is I'll just pull somebody up and I'll say, what's God telling you for them? It is amazing how God can begin to speak to you if you focus on someone other than yourself. You have to be able to focus on others to be used by God. If you don't have a heart for others, then are the, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit just for you when you're all alone in your prayer closet? I mean, how many of us operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we're all alone? Um, so the, the, just the ability to focus on somebody else. Just, just I, I'm trying to get to the point, Pastor Wayne Drain's been kind of pushing me, um, to do this, but I'm trying to get to the point that I could be open to God using me like that even as I come up in the pulpit on a Sunday. And it's happened a few times just as I've been open to it. Or I'm worshiping in the front row and God's putting somebody on my heart and I know that they're there in that service in that congregation. And so I don't know about, about you, but I need to go give that message to them before I can preach, I can't even think about my message because God's given me a word for somebody and just to go to them and to give that. The second thing I would encourage you to do is just boldly step out. Just boldly step out and maybe, you know, touch base with your, with your pastor and just say, I think God's beginning to speak to me. How would you have me handle this? And, and you know, hopefully your pastor's encouraging you in that and he wants you to step out. But I love community when it comes to prophecy because it's biblical. Um, we, we know um, in Scripture that um, in 1 Kings 18, Obadiah hit 100 prophets from Jezebel. We know in 2 Kings chapter 2, you'll notice four times sons of the prophets were mentioned. Notice how that was community-based. It was community-based, and we know that the sons of the prophet approached Elisha before Elijah was taken up, and they said, don't you know your master is going to be taken from you? So they knew them. So if there were sons of the prophets, then who were the fathers? There must have been some kind of mentoring, must have been some kind of prophetic 
community going on. Must have been. And so I, I think it, it really, really healthy that prophecy is in, it's in community. It's not like these lone wolves that are pulling people off to the side and getting theirs. I like words given in pairs or, or threes and, instead of just somebody, you know, because how do I know that someone's intentions are good? You got a, you know, a good looking young single guy and he's always getting words for the ladies. How do I know, you know, we want to make sure that there's accountability, accountability. Um, you're going to notice in 1 Corinthians 14 that prophecy is for building up and it's for edifying the church. Verses 3 through 5, verses 12 and 31, it all speaks about edifying the church. I struggle with someone who's prophetically gifted who seems to really have no heart for the church. They just want to, they just want to cut it loose and, and rip it, and then you know, they could be gone in a week or two and down the road, you know, because I guess the cloud lifted, glory cloud, and they're down, they're down the road. I, I don't understand not having a heart or for the body of Christ. I don't understand not having a burden for the body of Christ. Why? Why is that? So I believe a prophet isn't someone who bounces from church to church with little to no accountability or, or no desire for community. You know, I, I, I think that you're to grow in your prophetic giftings. And so how do you do that? And I think as pastors, we need to provide an atmosphere for that. And I'm so grateful for this network because of that. And I believe that the prophetically gifted can, can give the impression at times, and, and hopefully you're not one, they give the impression at times that, you know, this is, this is who I am and this is what my gift is. I'm not looking for a church to attend. I'm looking for a throne to ascend. And I, I, really, really, I really, really think that pastors need to come alongside of these folks and say, you know what, I recognize the gift on your life, and I can help. Um, but can you yield and can you submit? And some of the godliest most prophetically gifted individuals that I've ever met are some of the most humble dudes. Pastor Wayne Drain, such a humble guy. Pastor Tom Lane, such humble men, such humble men. You wouldn't know who these guys are if they weren't standing in front of you and talking to you. So unbelievably humble. And there's something about humility that just says that, oh my gosh, I love these people. I can work with them. There's a wonderful gifting on their life, and yet they have no problem yielding it or submitting. What if your pastor says, I don't think it's time for that right now? I mean, I've been in the pulpit working towards an invitation towards the end of the service and having people walk out and come to me. I don't even want to know what the word is. This is not the time right now. This is not it. And if you were sensitive at all to the Holy Spirit, you would sense that, that we're, we're bringing this in and we're going to throw the net out here in a minute and I could really use your prayers right now. I believe the foundation of healthy biblical prophecy is love, edification, and community. B biblically, love, edification, community, Old and New Testament alike. And where those things are absent, and you got these lone guns. I mean, we should all get them. I remember Laverne and Shirley and Lenny, he had a coat that had the lone wolf on the back of it. I think sometimes we need, let's make a bunch of shirts. These are lone wolves. You know, we don't know how long they're going to be here. They're just going to, you know, grip it and rip it, and then they're going to be down, down the road. I, I, we need to have some kind of culture for the prophetically gifted people to, to flourish. Life groups, what a wonderful opportunity. You know, just at the end of a life group, anybody got any prayer requests? You ask for prayer requests, and then, hey, why don't we just wait on the Holy Spirit for a minute and see what the Holy Spirit's saying. What a great opportunity just to lean in, just to lean in. And just do that. I mean, how hard is it? What opportunity are we offering? And I understand, pastors, that it can be intimidating, but what opportunity are we offering people to grow? I'm so grateful that I had a pastor that he, you know, yeah, we had two three-hour services and, and, and everything, but he allowed me the room, the room to grow, and he recognized the gift in my life. And, uh, and so I, I just want to, I want to encourage. So here are some Dangers that I've seen in those that are used prophetically. I've mentioned the one, I have the gift of prophecy. When that is the thinking, prophecy becomes one's identity and not Christ. You know, why don't you come up and tell me that you have Jesus? You know why? It, it, and again, it's not your gift. You don't own it. It's not yours. It's not yours. My, my sons can borrow my car but it's my car. 
and I would appreciate it if they ever want to use my car again that they treat it like it's not theirs and like it's mine. <laughs> and if you really love your dad, maybe you could put a little gas in there <laughs> after you, after you. And so how are we treating the Holy Spirit's gifts? Are we treating them like they're ours? That I can just behave any way that I want to? That is not God honoring. Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It should all be about Jesus. All be about Jesus. If it's not about Jesus, what is it about? And consistent with scriptures is that you can prophesy out of your own imagination. This is being recorded. Okay. I hurt for all of the prophetic voices that went on record and said that Trump was going to be president. I hurt. We've got to be able to separate our desires and our wishes and, and our wants because it's not about us. It's about what the Holy Spirit's bringing, what's the whole, what the Holy Spirit's giving, and that is what we must give. And you would do well to remove as much of your flesh from that as possible. Don't tack anything onto it. Just, just give what God's given. And you have no idea. It could be as simple as, man, the Lord just really wants you to know how loved you are. He loved you so much. You might think, ah, oh, that's so basic. I've seen words like that given and people crumple and they just start bawling. You have no idea what somebody's going through. No idea. No idea. And, and the more you begin to step out, and, and you're, you're going to have to step out, you're going to find out, oh, my gosh, that's, that encouraged them so much because that's what prophecy is all about. Edification, exhortation, comfort. That word comfort, it's a word you don't probably see too many word studies on. Um, the, the root of that word, it, it, we, we get this sense, this sense that that word comfort means to like some, some, some balm or some, you know, um, it's much stronger than that. Um, the, 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 the Latin that it came from is fortis, and it means to fortify. It means to encourage to speak courage when you're comforting somebody. Hey, come on, we can make it through this. Come on, we can do this. God's got you. Come on, hasn't God delivered you before? Hasn't God set you free before? Come on. So prophecy can be, can be very strong, but it's very encouraging. In its essence, it's encouraging. It's edifying. It builds up. doesn't tear down. I've been in, I've been in prayer meetings before where people um, believed that they had a word from the Lord that, um, someone who's going to try to take the pastor's life. That's not prophecy. <laughs> and as a pastor, that would not be very encouraging, and that wouldn't be building me up. I'm just trying to help. I believe that people that struggle with, with submission think that the prophecy is theirs. You, you, if it's God's, you can't be afraid. You bring it to your spiritual leadership, lay it before them. I believe I have a word. This is what it's about. Whatever you want to do with it, Pastor. Yes. Whatever you want to do with it. My Bible says humility precedes honor. Yes. Humility goes before honor. Yes. I have seen prophetic circles grow smaller and smaller because there's almost this demand for, for recognition and uh, I believe influence is lost as a critical spirit is adopted, bordering on Gnosticism. And I, and, I, and I get prophetically gifted people saying, well, you know, pastor never, never listens to you. Well, man, just lay it before him and, and, and let him chew on it. I've had people, you know, come and give me words in a service, and I'm about ready to walk up, and, oh, man, that's God, you know. And um, someone just came to me and said that there's a word. Right now, we're just going to pray. But we're just going to open it up right now. We're just going to lean into that right now. Seeing so many amazing things happen in moments like that. So healthy prophecy focuses on others and not self. Focuses on others and not self. Is submitted and not prideful. You know what breaks pride quicker than anything? Accountability. Think about how much hidden, closet, habitual sins are rooted in pride. The man struggling with pornography that doesn't want to have an accountability partner. He's in deep weeds, isn't he? Accountability breaks pride. Breaks pride. Pride wants the kingdom. Humility serves the kingdom. 
My Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Why can't you lay it out there for other prophetically gifted people to look at that and say, man, that really, really is God. That's really the Lord. Why can't we do that? Biblical prophecy screams love, edification, community, accountability. It screams it. Biblical prophecy does. And if you're looking for it, you're going to find it from the old to the new. You're going to find it in the Old Testament before the Holy Spirit was given and in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 14, just read that chapter. It is loaded with how the Holy Spirit's heart is for the building up of the church, the building up of the body of Christ. You'll, you'll notice the context of prophecy over and over and over again is building up, building up, building up. It's edifying. It's encouraging. It's breathing life into again and again and again. I felt today that coming in that there would be folks here that are, are struggling with prophetically gifted people. Really felt that in my heart. And what do you do when you've seen God use somebody and you know that it was the Lord and yet there might be something about that person that just says, man, they aren't submitted. Man, they don't, have the, they don't have my heart. They don't have the DNA of this church. They're not embracing this vision. They're not, you know, what do you, what do, you do with people like that? Yet you sense a genuine and a bona fide gift. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You pastor them, pastor. That's what you do. You love on them and say, man... God uses you, why don't we meet? If we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18, don't you think that the giftings of the, of the Holy Spirit and our ability to be used in those, don't you think that that's a part of our growth? It says to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What if there's a, a grace on your life? You, it, it is, it's, a, it's not a difficult thing for you just to, to ease into giving prophetic words. Um, what, what if that's a grace on your life? How are you going to grow in that? And pastors, how are we going to embrace these people? I, I think of the Apostle Paul. There were two individuals in his life that were, that, were, that were powerfully used by God. Ananias, who came and laid hands on him, and the scales fell from his eyes. And the Barnabases that encouraged him put his arm around him and said, no, 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 this guy's legit. I think you need both. You need those that are going to lay hands on, and you need those that are going to put, put their arms around you. And I really, really believe that, pastors, we cannot be intimidated um, by prophetically gifted people, but they should be willing to, to, to come under and to recognize you as a spiritual authority in their life. And I don't care how much older they might be than you, you can be a father to them. Probably one of the most difficult things for me to realize as a young guy starting a church um, was that I was a father in the body. And I'd have these older men, and they would be hanging around me, and, I'd, and it would be, like, awkward because guys were not the best communicators in the world, you know. And so these guys behind I'm like, what is his deal? Oh, my gosh, I'm a dad. Um, and, the, and the light kind of went on. And we need, we need healthy, secure pastors um, that, will, that will speak in to the lives of prophetically gifted people. We need them in the body. We need them in the body. We need them. And so why don't I, you know, open it up um, for any questions right now, and then I'll want to wanna pray for you at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great question. Um, the question was for the, the recording, um, you know, have begun to lean into this. Where do we go? How can we foster 
um, you know, people prophetically. I'm going to recommend a book. Um, it's what we use in our prophetic classes. Uh, we use this book as a template. Um, it's called He Still Speaks by Pastor Tom Lane and Pastor Wayne Drain. What a great, great book. In fact, Pastor Wayne Drain has now come out with a, with a He Still Speaks to Children. Um, so we haven't graduated to our children prophesying yet, um, but we have our youth. And um, our youth are, are now speaking over each other, and, and they're, it's, it's been amazing. So we use that book as a template, and we have a prophetic class. And then at our prophetic class, um, we'll, we'll go through maybe like a chapter of the book, and you could just go through the book, and you can kind of pull out the things you want to focus on. And then at the end of every class, um, we'll have someone come, okay, sit in the chair. Okay, who's getting anything? Who's getting anything? And, and so they grow both with uh, something that they can have in their hands, a, you know, a physical you know, curriculum of sorts, and then they're, they're involved in activation. So they're, they're stepping out. And honest, you know, you would be, you'd be, well, why don't we just do this right now? So come here, my dear. What do you feel God's telling you right now? Notice immediately you're focusing on her. How you're leaning in. Could be a scripture, could be a word, could be a picture. I hear servant leader. Servant leader. Grace. Grace. Intercessor. Intercessor. grace all over you beautiful daughter gosh this is so debilitating and discouraging these words that are coming <laughs> forth I don't know why we would want this in the body um, it's it's not I'm sorry my sarcasm I'm youngest to seven kids it just comes natural um, you can sit down not hard focus just an ability to focus. It's not a difficult, difficult thing, difficult thing. I just hear the Lord say that there are things that you've been weeping over in your prayers and that God's going to answer those tears. Spurgeon said the tears are liquid prayer. And I just saw you weeping, like almost like a portion of your time alone with the Lord was spent in, in tears. And there are burdens on your heart and that God is going to answer um, those tears, and sometimes those are the purest form of prayer. And so rest assured, God's in this. He's not abandoned you. He's not left you, okay? Um, yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, I'm young in this, and how do I use discernment and knowing when to go to somebody? I'll, I'll answer this in, in a couple ways. There are times when you might discern something about someone, and that's not necessarily something you go to them about. And just log that. And keep in mind that part of the Holy Spirit's ministry is to call to your remembrance. And so what I'll do, um, many, many times I'm beginning to get a, to get a word, and, and I, I don't feel it strong enough to maybe jump out. I'll try to, to push it away. I'll try to suppress it because I know that if it's the Holy Spirit, it will dog me. It'll chase me down. The Holy Spirit's the hound from heaven, he's been called. He will chase you down. And, and then if, if you know that you are supposed to do something, it won't go away but I would try to make it go away. Just go back to worship or, or go back to taking notes in the service or whatever. And if it's still lingering, then go up to those people and just say, I believe the Lord's speaking to me about you. Could I pray for you? And, and, and just as an easy and as natural a way as possible, don't come up to them, start frothing at the mouth and say, thus saith the Lord. 
you know, with a cowbell in your hands. Um, so, um, no, do not bring the cowbell. Um, Dylan. Yeah, all in about 15, 20 seconds. So, what, so our, our front row, um, you know, our leadership, uh, me, my wife, our elders, we try to have our leadership t- sit towards the front because our congregation needs to see our leaders worshiping the Lord too. They need to see. Um, and so um, they'll come up. I, I think I got a word. <clears throat> okay, what is it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or could we hold on that? It sounds like a little mini sermon there. Can we wait? Can we? Can you sit on that a little bit longer? Um, and who knows? Maybe while I'm preaching, I'm working towards an invitation at the end of the service. You know, when someone came to me before the, uh, the, you know, before I got up here, and they and they gave a word. But some kind of check and balance. I don't, I don't know if I'm necessary. And I'm please. I, we're all growing, so I'm not saying I got a corner on anything. I don't know if I'm a big fan for an open mic. Depends on the word, Dep- you know. Like you know, I, I, I see the Lord sending you to Africa. Maybe some follow up, you know. <laughs> I, I, you know. So, so, um, anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. You sinners. <laughs> you. Great question. Uh, beginning in prophetic ministry um, uh, in a Baptist church, um, how do we navigate that with people that aren't open to it? I'd say language is really, really important. Um, hey, we're 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 gonna be holding prophetic presbytery. What the heck is that? You know? Hey, we just uh, we get together and we just kind of wait on the Lord and we allow God to use us and speak through us. Notice the difference. It's a lot more inviting, and it's not so intimidating, you know. Um, I'm a prophet, and I am just going to unload on you what God gives me. And many times seen fire come out of my mouth and off the ends of my fingers. So the language that you use, the language that you use can be inviting. And just get them, get them into the water. Who cares if they're in the shallow end, you know, to start? Just get them in the water. Have you ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit? With the evidence of speaking in tongues, have you ever, um, could we pray for that? Could we, are you open to that? You know, um, and I'm not saying that tongues is the end all be all evidence, but more often than not it is. Um, so, I mean, let's, uh, you know, if there's anybody that, that wants more, not a determiner as to whether we go to heaven or not, but doggone it, man. It'll like put bullets in your gun that you didn't have before and um, God wants to use you kind of thing. Um, Sure, sure. So, um, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12. Um, a word of knowledge has to do with the past or the present word of wisdom, with the future. And a prophecy is speaking like the heart of, the God, heart of God for a moment. Heart of God for a moment. And so, and, and, and prophecy can have elements of it, but I, I had a word of, word of knowledge, um, saw you... Um, praying and weeping and um, God's answering those so word of knowledge past or present word of wisdom future 
prophecy is, you know, if you, if you study it out, it literally talks about a bubbling up in, the, in a moment. You're speaking the heart of God in a situation. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Matt. Great question. Um, I remember how I talked about how um, a prophet is part of the fivefold ministry. And the Bible says that the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4 is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. If someone is, is, is in the office of a prophet, they're going to be in full time ministry somewhere. They're going to be getting groomed for it because they're an equipper in the body. Okay? And so I would say that a corrective word like that probably has a tendency to come more from an equipper in the body um, you know because we know that all scripture is profitable you know it can rebuke it can correct it can and so they're probably someone that is regularly ministering the word if it's someone that's young in their prophetic gift yeah it might be tainted you know a little bit and so as a lead pastor have the courage to say um, you know, I don't think that's a word for the whole body. I think that might be something that God might be speaking to you about personally. I, I like to share the story. Years ago, um, um, Pastor Ron McLean, uh, my wife and I, we all grew up, uh, uh, Pastor Lee, we all grew up in, a, in, a, in, you know, GR first, and our pastor was very, very good at knowing whether something was from, for a word for the body or not. And uh, you know, one day you're in one of those lulls and in those moments where you know a word could pop, you can just all feel it. There's an anticipation. Something's about to break. Somebody's got something. We'll even ask in our church, man, does somebody have something right now? And we'll just ask, well, in this moment, this, this, this gal yells out, thus saith the Lord, just as there are many various kinds of chocolate cake. And, uh, and, pastor, and pastor said, sister, 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 I believe that's a word just for you. I don't believe it's for, for the whole body. And my buddy's in the front row of the choir loft, and he gets this confused look in his face. Five-year Bible college student, confused look in his face. Just how many kinds of chocolate cake are there? <laughs> I laugh out loud, and pastor turns around at the choir loft, and I'm just, I'm just looking down. So um, a, a corrective word like that? Okay, so let's say someone's got a bona fide, bona fide word of correction, and, and they're pure-hearted and they're humble. Grab somebody with you. If it's a gal, grab a gal. You know, if it's a guy, bring another brother. Hey, come over here. I think I got a word. Um, man, you're, you know, you're, you're starting to take a class to pursue the call of God in your life, and you're living with someone, and you're not married. Um, no. Let's make a choice right now. And, uh, and so bring somebody with you. So that that person can say, no, 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 I was right there. That's not what, what was said. There's a reason why Pastor Wayne Drain writes down all of his words on a yellow piece of paper. Pastor, you once gave me a word. Show me the yellow piece of paper. Let's read it together. So, anybody else? Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. That's a great question. Great question. The question was, what do you do when you've got um, prophetic people that are trying to direct the vision of the church? It's, it, the question is being asked from a senior pastor um, standpoint. Um, I would say um, there already is a vision, and I need you to get it and, and to run with it. Um, and if you're really convinced that God is giving you a vision, maybe you need to pray about whether you should be pastoring a church. Um, because two roosters in the hen house, 
two visions in a church is division. And so sometimes um, there are people that, that they don't have the guts to step out and do what God's leading them to do. And they're trying to, to almost, uh, almost half-heartedly um, fulfill what God's been speaking to them about through you. And they'll get frustrated with you. Well, I think the church should be doing this or that. I remember telling one seasoned prophetic voice who was so critical of the church that he didn't even attend one. And I had to tell him, I can't have you speak at my church if, if you don't see enough value in the body of Christ for you and your family to be attending one. Well, John, I haven't found a church that, you know, we like yet. And I said, well, if you think everybody's doing it wrong, maybe you need to start one. Why don't you show us all how to do it right? You know, so um, I think sometimes it's a, I'm not denying that, that there might be some things God's showing you. I'm just telling you this is the vision of our house and this is who we are. I've had so many people come up and say, don't you think we should have this ministry? I had a gal come up to me one time and say, don't you think we should have a hospice ministry? And I said, I, I think hospice ministry is amazing. That is not in my heart. I said, is it in your heart? Why are you trying to get me to run with the vision that God gave you? Man, you're going to wear me out. <laughs> I got one, and I'm doing all, all I can to fulfill what God's given me. So... Yeah, I'll take a few more. It's like five after, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, question is, you know, that somebody um, before they knew the Lord would get these premonitions or they'd, they'd see people dying and, and it would come to pass. If there's a true, there's got to be a false. The um, Bible's full of false prophets. Um, and so I think, I think this, um, let me answer it in kind of a kind of different way. Um, Michael Jackson was anointed. He was a commanding presence on the stage. Oh, my. Submitted to the Holy Spirit, what could have happened? Um, what could have? So, yeah, I think that there are uh, psychics. I, I, the difference would be the source that you're getting your info from. And so I don't, I don't believe in ghosts. You know, I don't believe that, you know, um, Uncle Edgar, who passed away 20 years ago, just walked through the room and looked at you and just kept walking through. I believe in familiar spirits. I believe in a good God and a bad devil. I believe in angels and demons. I don't believe that there's a whole bunch of gray out there and, you know, there are good witches and bad witches. I, I believe that it's a lot more clear cut than that. And so what's the source? I had one gal tell me she ran a New Age store where I lived, and she would have psychics in. Um, all the time. And she said, all of my psychics attend churches. And I'm thinking, I want to see a list of your psychics. I want to know if they're in my church. And, uh, <laughs> and so here's what, a, here's what a psychic will, will say. They'll say their gift is from God, but they won't say that their information is from God. Who's your source? Who's your source? Um, Holy Spirit is showing me right now. Who's your source? Um, so yeah, did I, is, is that a decent enough? Okay, okay. Yeah, tough, tough, tough. I'll take one more and we're almost 10 after. Yes, sir. Wow, look at the time. I, I, I got a, uh, uh, um, the, qu the <laughs> question was, how, do, how does the local church handle national? Um, oh, I get them all the time. People send me videos all the time. Pastor, if you have an hour, can you watch this? Why would you believe I don't have an hour? Um, so um, I, uh, I don't want to follow a guy. I don't want to follow a gal. I don't care how well they're used. 
Um, and a lot of people got their feelings hurt. And a lot of people lost credibility because they went on record saying this, that, or, or another thing. Um, you put anybody on a pedestal, it is not going to be long. Um, and we need to look no further than some of the recent stuff that's come out. I'd, I'd, and I hurt. I hurt when we put anybody on a, on a pedestal. Um, I, 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 my heart aches um, for all the people that have just gotten crushed um, recently. And so I, God's called me to, to Ionia, Michigan. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, pray for the peace of of the, the, the city or the place that I've called you to, for it's in, in its peace, you'll find peace. Or in its prosperity, you'll find prosperity. This is where God has called me. If God's given you a national ministry, uh, you, you know, good for you. Um, I, I don't know if necessarily that's, and I don't know if we're going to be trying to steer the direction of our church based on what prophet or prophetess so-and-so just said on YouTube. Um, and so, and how nice, you don't have to be accountable, you know, to those people, you know, Joel Osteen isn't your pastor, you know, and, and, uh, and there are some, you know, wonderful, prophetically gifted people out there, um, but don't come to me as a pastor and say, I just heard this word, and I think we need to do this, um, and don't try to force feed me, you know, some video, what you want to do is you want to pray for me so that I would hear God, so that I would have a direction, um, so, I don't know, is that okay? All right, all right, all right. Okay, guys, well, let me pray for you. Father, um, thank you for these amazing folks. God, I, I pray now that, you know, you've, you've, you've filled our spirits now, fill our bellies. Father, bless us the rest of this day. And, Father, I just pray that we go back ignited, Father, to, to speak your word, to declare your word, to be your voice to our generation. And, Father, I'm reminded of Acts 13 that it says, after David had done the will of God in his generation, that he went home to be with the Lord. And so, Father, here we are to do the will of you, O oh God, in our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.